when we introduced the idea of motion in the sky, we started with diurnal motion. The Earth is rotating. The stars look like they rise in the east. They set in the west. Uh, so that's that's just kind of the uh, uh, daily motion, uh, hence diurnal motion. And, and if you go out at night and just be calm and look up, you notice everything is slowly shifting. So you, you see where things are, and you wait a few minutes, and, and you notice things are a little bit different. For example, if you sit like under the edge of a building or tree or something and see what stars you see right on the edge of it, they shift in just a few minutes, and you see different ones. It's they, 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 uh, they, they gradually change. Uh, in, in total, the, the sky sh turns about 15 degrees per hour. We also realize that uh, the sky shifts almost a degree a day, and that's because of Earth's motion around the sun, annual motion. You combine the diurnal and the annual motions together, and you get the basic idea of keeping track of time. Uh, uh, whether it be years, which is related to the annual motion, or days, hours, minutes, etc., which relate to the diurnal motion. Then you, d you can realize that everything shifts in the sky a little bit more, that all the coordinates that we very carefully described for the sky, the right ascension declination, they shift back and forth. And they shift back and forth a little bit uh, because of the precession or the change in the direction, the tilt of the Earth. Then we also realize that the amount of the tilt of the Earth wobbles a little bit, and that's called nutation, and that also shifts the right ascension and declination. So, so all those shifts happen all the time. The ancients, however, in the ancient world, they noticed that there seemed to be some discrepancies between positions of stars that some ancient people had measured and what they were measuring, and they suspected maybe the stars didn't always stay put. Uh, that was really borne out, finally proved in 1718 by Sir Edmund Halley. Halley was noticing that the stars Sirius, Arcturus, and Aldebaran were about a degree away from where Claudius Ptolemy recorded their positions. Now, Ptolemy uh, lived in Alexandria. He was a Greek uh, living in, in Egypt, modern-day Egypt, and uh, was working at the library at Alexandria, uh, which was repository of all knowledge. And so he, he was looking at uh, all of astronomy. He wrote this great book called The Almagest, which was the uh, summation of all that was known at the time about astronomy. And so he, he uh, was writing down these positions. Now, these stars, Sirius, Arcturus, and Aldebaran, turn out to be very important stars. Uh, Aldebaran was a royal navigation star. It was one of the, the most important stars that the ancients used for navigation purposes, still used for navigation among those that do celestial navigation. Arcturus was an extremely important star in religious uh, ceremonies to the Greeks, uh, uh, and especially to the Egyptians, and, and, and actually much of the um, eastern Mediterranean. And so uh, Sirius was also important. The Egyptians especially were big on Sirius because they noticed that, that, remember, I talked about how the sky shifts a little bit every day. All the stars rise four minutes earlier every day. They noticed that Sirius would rise right before the sun uh, when the Nile was about to flood. So they, 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 it was called the heliacal rising of Sirius. And so uh, they noticed that, and they counted how many days it took until that kept repeating. And then that's how the Egyptians discovered there's 365 days in a year. Now, Sirius was very important to them because they, when they saw Sirius rising with the sun, they knew the Nile was about to flood. The only part of, the, of Egypt where you can actually grow crops right along the Nile, so you want to get the, the crops harvested right before it floods. And so when they saw Sirius rising before the sun, they'd send word out it's time to harvest crops. Uh, this is where they got the idea originally that something happening in the sky affected Earth. Now, obviously, this didn't always work right. Sometimes the weather, you know, caused it to flood earlier, and then they just, like, 
executed the sky priest and got new ones because, you know, they, they did not forecast the weather properly. We don't do that with weather forecasters today, so there's less incentive to be accurate. But given how important Sirius, Arcturus, and Aldebaran were, um, in fact, Sirius even to the Greeks, because the Greeks n noticed that Sirius would rise with the sun during the hottest part of the year. And so they mistakenly thought that's why it was hot. Uh, the Romans, when they uh, 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 conquered the Greeks, they got this idea that Sirius rising with the sun made it hot. Romans noticed the dogs had rabies more in the summer than the winter time, and so uh, they thought that Sirius rising with the sun was giving the dogs rabies. So they called Sirius the dog star. Um, and in the summer, when they saw Sirius rising with the sun, to keep dogs from getting rabies, to make it the knowing of the hottest time of the year, they sacrificed dogs to Sirius. And so they call those the dog days of the summer. Now, Edmund Halley, now, so, so, so he noticed these stars were about a degree off of where Ptolemy said they were. Now, why is this important? A degree is roughly twice the width of the full moon. Now, for stars that are this important, do you think that Ptolemy, one of the greatest astronomers of the ancient world, would have gotten these three stars that far off when he got so many others dead on? Probably not. So Edmund Halley suggested that stars actually do move. It was a number of years later until they started to actually be able to measure stars' motion. We call this the proper motion of the stars. Uh, here's an example here of the current record holder, and that is Bernard's star. So uh, there's a picture in 1894 on the left over here, and so you can see Bernard's star right there, and then the arrow points to a slightly different spot here. So uh, that star right right there is the same as this star right here. So it was uh, it moved a little bit. From, from one to the other. So it moved from just down into the left of that other star to just up and to the left of it. And so uh, that is the effect of proper motion. Uh, Bernard's star uh, uh, was, was discovered in the early part of the 20th century and it displaced the old record holder, which was something called Captain's star. And Captain's star replaced another one, 61 Cygni, as the record holder. And so uh, the star currently uh, is the record holder and uh, for the fastest moving star, fastest, biggest proper motion. And it moves about 10, a little bit more than 10 and a third arc seconds per year. And so uh, right, right here, I've got an animation showing it over uh, about uh, uh, um, couple decades there shifting in the sky relative to the background. One of the uh, Stellarium labs that you're going to do is going to actually utilize this uh, star. You're going to find this star and find it shifting over the course of uh, decades. And so uh, that's one of the labs that you will be doing is looking at this star. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, obviously Edmund Halley realized that it moved, and so we can calculate where was it in the past, where is it going to be in the future. We also know how to measure distances. We'll talk about how we're going to do that in upcoming lecture, but we're able to measure distance to it and realize it's actually getting closer to us. So it's already the brightest star in the sky other than the sun, and it's going to be even brighter in the sky in the distant future when it's closer to us. So right now, Sirius is, 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 is down from Orion. So what's going to happen, though, in, in a number of years, it's going to be way below Orion, Orion here. And in fact, when it ha happens, it's going to be below the horizon in the northern hemisphere, uh, for most of the northern hemisphere. Uh, but it'll be even brighter than it is today. So Sirius moving a little bit. Okay, uh, The stars that make up the Big Dipper are also moving. So here's an animation showing over tens of thousands of years how the shape of the Big Dipper changes due to the proper motion of those stars. Each one of them is moving slightly differently. Well, it turns out that what, part of what's causing the proper motion is our galaxy 
has stars all going around here, and the sun's going around, and the stars are, are taking different times to go around, and so they're going slightly different speeds. So if you go off and look at them, then they, their position in the sky gradually shifts. It's kind of like you're driving down the highway, and you look off to the side, you see some cars, but as you're driving, the angle you look to see those cars can slowly change if you're not all driving exactly the same speed and in formation. So that means that star clusters, nebulas, other sort of objects that are in our galaxy can change. We also know that galaxies themselves are moving through space here. And so if you're on a galaxy and you're looking at another galaxy, as time passes, you would have to look at a different angle to see the other galaxy. So galaxies can shift their, pos their position in the sky also. So galaxies also have proper motion. Uh, it, and it's just that galaxies are so far away, the proper motion is so small, it was not even measurable until the year 2005. And, and now we can measure proper motions of some of the nearby galaxies. So again, when you are giving positions of something, particularly something that has lots of proper motion, you need to say what year the position is for. That's especially true for something like Bernard star. So with this, we now have finally moved from chapter two, which is proper, which is the motion of the earth making the sky look like it's shifting. And we're still talking about motions of things in the sky, but now proper motion brings us to chapter 17, which is motion of stars. So we've talked about, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that the physics 1403 class is going to be uh, stars and galaxies. Uh, it's the second half of the book. So most of the stuff that I've been covering so far this semester is going back to the first part of the book. And it's the same stuff that I covered in the Physics 1404 class, the solar system. Uh, so I'm giving you kind of a background sort of stuff there so that we're getting ready now to actually finally start talking about stars. And so that's our next set of topics is stellar astronomy.